Welcome to those that have uh, joined us now on Facebook or YouTube. Um, we're always excited this time of the year. It's a time when we are tired and so we need something to energize us. And that's why it's important to be here on a Sunday, to be energized. So uh, my, my, my title today, Living on Purpose. Living on Purpose. This might not be a completely new concept or a new message. It is a new message, but it's not a new, might not be a new concept. We've preached about this before. The problem with us is we hear so many good messages, we just forget to put them into practice. So uh, th that's why sometimes we need to go back and just hear the message again and then make certain decisions in our lives to put them into practice. So I want to just read a short part out of Genesis 37 from uh, the life of Joseph. We're not going to just stick to that part. There's lots I want to say. And uh, my Bible school students always tease me when I take my watch off. Because they say it doesn't mean anything anyway. But uh, I'm taking it off anyway. See the time. Let's read from Genesis 37, from verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Belah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So uh, he, he just came to tell some tales about what they were doing. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying, in his mind. Just that section out of the word. The gift of vision, the gift of purpose, the gift of knowing what God has called me to. Many of you sitting here today, God has already spoken to you. You've been thinking about it a lot. You've been dreaming about it. You've been talking about it, but somewhere in our lives, we've got to get to the place where we start putting it into action. All right, so the gift of vision. Sight is the function of the eyes. Vision is the function of the heart. Let me say that again. Sight is the function of our eyes. Vision is the function of our heart. That's why Paul writes, and it's not on the board, but Paul writes, we do not live by sight, but we live by faith. Faith and vision is the same. Because what is faith? Faith is seeing things that are not as if they are. That's what faith is. Vision is seeing things that are not yet as if they are. And so faith is the function of the heart. This is what Miles Monroe says. He also says, I show you what is, vision shows you what could be. Proverbs 29 verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he who keeps the law, he is blessed. 
Where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, God says, my people fall apart. Where there is no vision, my people have no focus to hold on to. Have no, has no dreams to hold on to. Has no, nothing to hold on to. And you see Joseph in his life. Most of us would love to have the ending of Joseph's life. But none of us would like to go through the same process. None of us would like to be hated by our brothers. None of us would like to be pushed aside by our brothers. None of us would like to be sold as a slave. None of us would like to be a slave boy in, a, in, the, in the house of a rich man. None of us would like to be accused of rape or attempted rape and be thrown into prison for many years. None of us would like to walk that road. Joseph had to walk that road and the only way that God could take him on this path was to give him a vision at a young age in his life. The Bible doesn't speak about much or speak much about Joseph holding on to that vision, it doesn't speak much about Joseph reminding himself of that vision of, or that dream. It doesn't say much about that. But Joseph knew in his heart that God has got a purpose with my life. That's why when he went into Potiphar's house, he was the best slave that Potiphar ever had, and Potiphar set him up over his whole home, his whole house, and the household. Joseph had a dream, and this dream drove him day by day, and drove him to live according to God's calling on his life, which was non-existent at that moment. And then when he was thrown into prison, he could have just gone to sit there and just say, ah, life has passed. Today, and in those days, if you get uh, accused and convicted of rape or attempted rape, you don't have a chance of getting out of your... In those days, you would die in prison. That was his end. But he had a dream, he had a vision, he heard from God, he knew God spoke to him. And he had to just hold on anyway. And my question will always be, what has God called you to? What is your purpose in life? If your purpose is to make money, <laughs> I've known many people whose purpose was to make money, and today they don't have anything. If your purpose is to make a name for yourself, I've known many people that made a name for themselves, and if you just listen to, to the news in the, in the church circles, major pastors that has had influence in my life through their teachings and their preachings, somewhere along the line, their name gets thrown to the ground and everybody tramples on it. it means nothing. What is your purpose? Is your, what, what is your purpose in life? And God says we're born for a purpose. We know the scripture, I, I, I come back to the scripture continually. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 to 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Let me just stop there. Before I formed you in the womb, when does forming take place? When mom and dad, whoever the mom and dad is, comes together intimately, and the seed and the ovary comes together, and conception takes place, that's when forming takes place, the beginning of the forming. God doesn't say, when you were formed, I knew you. He says, before you were even formed. And I'm going I'm to go through some scriptures today so we can see this. Before you were even formed. Before your dad had a twinkle in his eye. When he looked at mom. Okay. 
Those of you that are married, you know, you, the, 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 the guys that are married, you know the twinkle. Okay. So before dad had a twinkle in the eye, God already knew you. He didn't know you when you were born. He didn't know you when you were being formed. He knew you before that. That's what the Bible says. I don't want to preach a whole sermon on that now. And then he says, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So God is speaking to Jeremiah and he says, you've got to understand that before you even were born, before you saw sunlight, before you breathed air, while you were still in your mother's womb, I already set you apart for a purpose. Every human being was born for a purpose. Every human being was born for a purpose. Definition of purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. In other words, the intent of the creator the intent of the creator is called purpose. Did you know that everything that was created on earth is here for a purpose? Did you know that a bee was created for a purpose? To fly to the, to the flowers and to pollinate and all, all, all the things there. I don't even remember all the words of, of what happens there. But you understand, the bee was made for a purpose. The sun was made for a purpose. You might think the purpose of the sun is sunset when you look out and you say, oh, what a beautiful sunset. Nothing was created for beauty. Everything was created for a purpose. But the, the purpose could, that which was created can be beautiful, I'm so thankful, otherwise I would be married to an ugly lady. But uh, my, my wife is so beautiful, she was created for a purpose. So it can be beautiful, but her purpose was not to be beautiful. That's just the cherry on the cake. But her purpose wasn't to be beautiful, her purpose was to be created for what God wanted her to do on, on this earth. And so everything is created. Nothing exists just for the fun of it. Nothing exists for experimentation. God didn't experiment with things. Everything is for a purpose. The sunrise or the sun, uh, the, the flowers. If there was no flowers and plants, we wouldn't have oxygen on this earth. They create oxygen. The colors of the flowers... Did you know that the colors of the flowers are so important because the color of the, the, the different colors attract different insects? And they need to be different colors to attract different insects and uh, etc. Even flies and mosquitoes has a purpose. Even the hairs in your nose has a purpose. Okay, so even when you start plucking them out, you're going to know even that has a purpose. Everything that was created has a purpose. And, and God designed nothing without a purpose. So, if I'm telling you this now, you've got to understand that there's no chance that everything could have just been created bah! with a big bang. Because nothing, a big bang, cannot create purpose. There is only one that can create purpose, and that is God. And if everything on this earth was created for a purpose, then you've got to understand today you're on this earth because you were created. For a purpose. You're not here just because. You're here because God created you for a purpose. His purpose in your life. 
You are not a mistake. There's none of you that is sitting here that is a mistake. God placed you on this earth, earth because there's something He wants done that requires your existence. But you've got to understand, it's not all about you. It's about Him. Yesterday I was speaking to one of my friends in Ukraine and uh, we were just discussing a few things and as I was, we were talking and we were talking about how people think that I am so important to God. Who of you think that you are important to God? Let me, no, no, don't put up your hands. Uh, let me just explain to you. You're not that important. If you're not there, God just put someone else there. He doesn't need you. He wants to use you. He created you for a purpose. But if you don't come to your purpose, you'll just get someone else. And yesterday someone uh, came here to, to the house yesterday and, and we were just talking uh, and, and, and he, he listened to a, a message someone, somewhere, I think it was John Bevere's message, uh, somewhere or a book or something. And, and John Bevere explains it as follows. He says, it's like God is a building constructor. This is the illustration. God is a building constructor. In, uh, yeah. And, and God has got a lot of people with certain purposes. Every person on the building uh, site, there's a purpose for them being there. But if any one of them thinks that they're important, it's about them, the building constructor just moves them out, just gets someone else in their place. But what his plan and his purpose is, will he will still reach his purpose. If his purpose is to build this big building, he will still build a big building. It doesn't matter. The certain people that are there is not that important. But when God comes, he says, I created you for this purpose. I want you to be part of of what I'm building, I want you to be part of my plan, I want you to be part of my bigger purpose, so please open up your hearts so that I can give you my vision, because with sight you can't get to it, I want to give you my vision, if you receive my vision you will understand that you can now be available for me. And so as I was speaking to my friend in Ukraine, it wasn't him that was here yesterday, it was someone else, but he was he's in Ukraine. So I was speaking to him uh, on, a, on, a, on a call, and, and we were discussing, and I said, you know what our problem is? We think we are so important to God, but it's actually the other way around. We should start understanding God is so important to me. That's why when we see wars and, and, and all these things that are happening at the moment and people are dying all over and people and, and, and we get all upset about death. Death does not face God. Because death is not the beginning and the end. Or the end. So when children's heads get chopped off, it's bad and it's terrible and we're living in this human terrible time on earth where these things are happening but God doesn't go oh I'm losing my plan I'm losing my purpose let's, let's just try and he, he doesn't get all panicky about it he's got a greater purpose and in his greater purpose the amazing thing is he looks at you and he says but I want you to be part of it I know how many hairs there's on your head. I know exactly who you are. I know what I've placed inside of you. I know the purpose that I built into your life from the beginning. I know the vision that I, that I had, this picture that I had, that before you were even formed, I knew you. And I want you to be part of my purpose. There are 
about 8 million, 8 billion, sorry, 8 billion people on earth. And did you know that about 98% of the 8 billion people on earth don't know their purpose, why they are on earth? That's bad news, huh? 98% does not know what their purpose is. But God has a purpose for your life, and that's why I'm preaching to you today. So no, no one here today is, is a, a biological mistake or an accident. In Afrikaans we say, a chlipsy. Did you didn't know that there's no chlipsies here? For those of you who don't understand, don't worry. You, you, you'll, you'll pick up the idea. No one. Your birth was within God's perfect time and in His planning. And I've said this a few times in the past weeks, that we are privileged to be on this earth in 2023, going into 2024, we are completely privileged because we are on this, this earth at this time for God's purpose and we will only be fulfilled in our lives when we start understanding His purpose and start walking in His purpose. Your parents did not determine that you would be on earth at this time. And then your family, your background does not determine your purpose. Who your father is, who your mother is, does not determine your purpose. Because God says, before you were even formed, I had a purpose for you. I knew you. They don't determine your purpose. It does not matter through what circumstance you ended up on this earth. You could be on this earth because of a loving mother and father and amazing uh, God-fearing parents and, and, and uh, they wanted a child and God gave them a child and you that child, uh, you just spoiled their godliness when you came, but that's okay. Uh, you that child and, and you, 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 that could be amazing. Or you could be on this earth Because your mother and father had a fight and then they just tried to make up. And then you came. Or you could be on this earth today with your mother was a young teenager and the hormones started turning into demons and, 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 and in, in, the, in, in the life of the young people like it is today and suddenly she became pregnant and you were born out of wedlock and you go and you think, oh, I'm an accident, axochlipsy. Do you not? Because God decided before He even created the earth, He decided that you should be here. You might even be as a result, and someone might be watching today, and you might even be on earth as a result of rape. You're still not an accident. You were planned. Did you know that there is no illeg illegitimate children on earth? Illegitimate, the word illegitimate means illegal, unlawful, illegal. There, is no, there are no illegal children on this earth. There, there, there's a few illegal parents on this earth. If, you, if they, they become parents out of wed, not being married, uh, then they're illegal. They're illeg illegitimate. But there's no illegitimate children on this earth. So it doesn't matter how you came to this earth. God knew you before your mother and father even knew themselves. And knew each other. Okay. Uh, so, you're on this earth to serve God's purpose. God's purpose is to do His will. Let's just read quickly Acts 13 verse 22 about David. And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, uh, so when God had removed Saul, he raised up David to be the king of whom he testified and said, I found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. In other words, I found David 
who was willing to live out the purpose that I placed him on earth for. So God placed us on earth with a purpose, to do his will. And then we read in verse 36 of Acts, this is Paul preaching and he's, and he's, and he's talking there and he's saying, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. David, after he had served God's purpose, I've, I've always said this, and, and, and uh, uh, um, I don't even know if I'll have a tombstone or not. They can just dump me in the sea or any place. It doesn't really matter because when I'm dead, I'm not here anyway. But wherever they put me and they want to put up a tombstone, then there's one thing that I hope that, I, that, 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 that my life will be a testimony of. And on my tombstone, when Michael had served God's purpose in his life, he fell asleep. My, 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 my biggest desire is to be known as someone that has served God's purpose on this earth. Not my own purpose, not what I want to do, not what I want to achieve. God's purpose on earth. So, God determines your purpose. God determines your purpose. Jeremiah 29 verse 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has already set up the plans for your life. Doesn't mean that you, you're building according to His plans. But He's already called you for a purpose. Listen to Psalm 139. It says, For you found my inward parts. David speaking. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book. Uh, in your book were written. Listen to this. In your book were written. Every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. In other words... You already wrote down my life, Lord, before I was even born. I'll explain that to you in a moment. So, in, in, in the Passion Translation, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Okay, the men say amen, because their wives are made mysteriously complex. But God made us mysteriously complex. Yeah, I've got to just get a smile out of you today somewhere. Uh, everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. Verse 16. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Isn't that amazing? You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. So you might ask the question, do you believe in predestination? Clear yay and the eight for kissing. Do you believe in predestination? Then I have to say to you, yes. But then I have to add, because if I just say yes, then everybody goes, he's become reformed. Okay, some will say he's become deformed, but anyway, that doesn't matter. But he's become reformed, okay, because he believes predestination. The Bible speaks about predestination. But the Bible also speaks about, if you, if, if you ask me, do I believe that we, do, that we have a choice. Uh, do not have a choice. Sorry. If I believe in predestination, let me just say it again. I say yes. If you say, do you believe that we do not have a choice? I say absolutely not. I believe that we are predestined. Predestined. Because we could make a choice. Now let me explain this quickly. God, I think I put it on the, on the board. God does not begin at the beginning. He starts at the end. 
You see, we, we've got this concept of God living in time. And we've got this concept of when God says, I, I already decided, God decided, now He forces us into this, whatever He's decided. But God created time 6,000 years ago. Before time was created, it was just eternity. There was no beginning, no end, no tomorrow, no yesterday, no nothing. It was just eternity. And then 6,000 years ago, God created time and He put it on earth and then He created man and He placed man into time so that man could live within time. And man is living in this box of time. But God is not contained in time. So God came and He says, listen to what what, what uh, Psalm verse 16, we just said, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, you wrote my life out before I was even born. But listen to Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. God is speaking. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring, listen, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose listen to this this, this is amazing did you know <laughs> that God finished your life before you started it did you know that your future is God's history. Now, see, you're not getting it. It's December, holiday time. <laughs> Let me say this again. Do you understand that your future is God's history? In other words, God put you on earth and gave you the chance to make all your decisions on earth because He gave us a free choice. We make all our decisions on earth and then He comes to the back and He says, all right, now I've seen what you've lived, now I will come and now I will put you on earth so that you can live it. I've seen all the mistakes you've made, now I'll put you on earth so that you can make all the mistakes. I've seen all the bad choices you've made, now, now I'll put you on earth so that you can make these bad choices. God knows the end from the beginning. He already knows who's going to hell and not going to hell. But he doesn't determine who's going to hell and not going to hell. You see, that's the difference between the predestination uh, teaching that says, Oh, if you are Afrikaner and you've been baptized as a little baby, you are predestined to go to heaven. And I've been to funerals over and over and over again where the pastor says, I know he's in heaven. He lived like hell on earth, but I know he's in heaven because I baptized him myself when he was a baby. That's predestination teaching, just on its own. But when we understand that God knows the end from the beginning, He knows all the choices we made when we haven't made them yet. Because He's not in time, He's outside of time. And He already knows, He doesn't determine who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. He gives that to us. That's a choice. He says, I give to you this choice. Make these choices in your life. But I already know the choices that you made. Does it make sense? Some of you are... Okay. That's okay. You can... Uh, I don't have that many pages, so don't, don't worry. Okay. God determines our purpose, but we must live our purpose. We read back in Genesis 45. So Joseph said to his brother, this is after he's been through this whole life of bad life, and he comes to Egypt and he's in prison and they take him out of prison and he, and he becomes a king just under Pharaoh. He becomes the one that's in charge of, of, of all of, of Egypt and basically the world at that stage. So Joseph said to his brothers when they came, he said, come near to me please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. 
And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Listen to verse 8. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. You thought you had it in your power to decide my life. I'm just letting you know it was not so. He says, ah, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And then we read in John 15, verse 15 to 17. Jesus is speaking. We know that whole scripture on uh, 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 the vine. And Jesus is speaking and he's saying, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Just listen to that. God says, I've given you the vision. I've given you the purpose for all that I have heard from my Father I've made known to you. Here's my purpose. And then he says, you did not choose me. Next one. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And when we read this, we go, okay, God chose me. So, so I don't have a choice. No, listen to this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Next one. And appointed that you should go and bear fruit. God didn't choose you to make fruit inside of you. God didn't choose you to live a fruitful life. God chose you so that you can make your own decision to live out the purpose that he has for your life, to live that out in your life. Seems like it's too deep for December, really. But we need to go deep because we're entering into 2024. That's going to be a major year. And if we don't understand our purpose, we're going to miss a whole year in our life at least. We need to know why God put us on earth so that we can enter into 2024. We need to know what God's calling on my life is. We need to know, but God's called me for business. Great. But what are you doing for him in business? Okay, I'll get to that in a moment. All right. So, and he called us to love one another as well. I've got to do that. Even though he chose me, I've got to do that in my life. Okay. So, if you know your purpose, listen to this. If you know your purpose, it determines how you live. If you don't know your purpose, I've told this story many times about that little boy who was in one of the comic strips. He had his bow and arrow. You know those arrows that's got a, a piece of rubber sucking, what, what do they call it, those rubbers that they, if you, you lick it, put it in, shoot against the wall and it goes, zzz, and it sticks. We will be like that little boy walking around, shooting, and wherever it lands, he takes out a piece of chalk, he draws a circle around and says, Bullseye! Bullseye is not where your arrow lands. Bullseye is where God wants you to land. And we miss bullseye, but we call it bullseye because it makes us feel good. But it's not God's plan or His purpose for our lives. If you know your purpose, it controls your decision making. If you know where you're going, you make decisions according to where you're going. If you know your purpose, it determines your relationships. Did you know that there are so many people that have no purpose that wants to be your friend because they want you to walk with them on their no purpose road? They don't want to walk with you, with you on the road that God has called you to for His purpose. So get rid of them. God puts people in your life, some of them, 
for a short time, some of them for a season, and some of them for life. Don't hang on to those that God put in your, in your life for a short season. You hang on to those and you neglect those that God has called to walk with you for life. When the season is past, shake it off and say, God, I'm moving on with those that have got the same mind, the same purpose that you have for my life. Okay. If you know your purpose, it controls how you spend your money. I can look at anybody and know where their purpose is according to where they spend their money. If your purpose, if you think a new car is your purpose, a new car is good and sometimes we need a new car. And sometimes we need a new vehicle. So please don't misunderstand me. But if that's your purpose in life, to get the newest model, the best model, the greatest model, uh, what a purpose to have. A bigger house, more beautiful furniture, and then you die. And you know what? When you die, your children don't even like your furniture that you had. They throw it out to the pawn shops. Or they put them in a store and they store them up where the rats enjoy the inside of your couch. Okay. Where you spend your money. There are many who are living their dreams. Many people living their dreams. Such a person sees his dream, he prepares for his dream, then he lives his dream. That's wonderful. But if his dream does not include Jesus Christ, when he dies, his dream becomes a nightmare. We need to hold on to God. Okay, so just quickly to end off. How do I know what God's purpose is for me? Many people ask the question. Okay, that's nice. That's good. I, I, I know God's got a purpose. But how do I know what God's purpose is for my life? How do I know what God's purpose is for me? Just a few points, not the Alpha and the Omega of all the points, just a few points that might help us. The first point is relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, you cannot find out what His purpose for your life is. It comes out of relationship. We need to sit with Him. We need to pray, spend time in His Word. We need to reflect on our lives. We need to know what God, why and what we, 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 we feel and experience that God is calling to us. And that's why Psalm 37 verse 4 and 5 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Uh, the prosperity teachers say, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. The true Christians say, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will change your heart to have His desires, and then He will give His desires to your life. Okay, your desire might be materialism, your desire might be all different kinds of things. But if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires that He will. Commit your way to the Lord, trust Him, and He will act. All right, number two. If you want to know if you're busy with God's purpose, God's purpose will always cost you. God's purpose will always cost you. Says Winston Churchill, he said the following, We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Luke 14 verse 33. <laughs> so therefore, this is so, I, I, I love preaching things that Jesus said. Because then you can't crucify me for what I'm saying. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you do not come to a place of surrender in your life, you cannot be God's disciple. That's what he says. Uh, okay. 
God's purpose took Joseph out of his family, out of his freedom, out of his comfort. Your dreams will take you out of your comfort zone. If you're living your purpose while you're living a comfortable life, <laughs> you're confused about your purpose. People don't like hearing this because people want to know, I can, I can live God's purpose and have a comfortable life. Um, unfortunately, it <clears throat> doesn't work that way. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your comfort. It's going to cost you things. And I'm not talking about materialistic, comfortable life. I'm just talking about it's going to make you uncomfortable to do what God has called you to do. If God has called you to pray for the sick, it's going to be uncomfortable because you're going to pray for the sick and they're going to die. And that's okay because your purpose is not to heal them. Your purpose is to pray for them and leave the rest for God. If your purpose is, is, is to look after the, 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 the homeless people, it's going to be uncomfortable. You can still live in the comfort of your own home. You can still have certain... But, but it's going to be uncomfortable. What is your purpose? What has God called you to? What has He placed it in your heart? Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The words of Jesus. Christian television and Christian preachers always wants to teach us that when you come to Christ, you're going to just get all the comfort that you can have. You just sow and you will reap and you will just... And you know how many people just here in Namahadi have sowed so much money that they are poor and their pastors are swimming in their money. Just by sowing doesn't make you rich. You're not going to reap, reap just because you sow. Okay, but let me not get into that now. The gate is narrow. It's difficult. All right. And then number four, three, God's purpose. Here's an important one. If you want to know if you're in God's purpose, God's purpose will never benefit you. God's purpose is never for your benefit. I'm not getting any amens. I might get an inner here and there, but, but uh, God's purpose is never for your benefit. Vision. I've, I've put a few points on the board. Vision is not ambition. Many people are ambitious and they say, I'm living out God's dream. You know how many people in America have tried to live out the American dream? And yet when they die, it's a nightmare. Vision is not ambition. It is for your own benefit. If it is for your own benefit, it's not from God. God's purpose is not self-centered. Always others-centered. It never benefits you, it benefits others. It will always improve humanity and uplift the downtrodden. That's what God's purpose for your life is. God's purpose for Joseph was not to be Lord over the people, but to serve and feed his family. God's purpose was that he would be in Egypt so that he would be able to be in a place where he can feed the, his family and where he can bring his family back to, uh, uh, not back, to Egypt so that they could be raised up so that God could use them and call them his own people. And then we know Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And here's the scripture, Mark 10 verse 42 to 45, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you 
must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's uncomfortable. It will never benefit you. It will always cost you. And then lastly, God's purpose for us is always to please Him. God's purpose, the goal of our lives, the aim of our lives, should be 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 in the English Standard Version. So, the, so whether you are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. NIV. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. In the Passion Translation, so whether we live or die, we make it our life's passion to live our lives pleasing to Him. The question is, do you want, do you want God's purpose to be your purpose in your life? The question is, do you want to live a fulfilled life or do you just want to live a life full of all different kinds of things? Do you want to have a life where you have the joy of God or do you want a life where you want to be happy? <coughs> Sorry. Did you know that if you want to be happy, you're usually only happy on your birthday and Christmas when you receive gifts. But if you want this joy, you can go to them through the most difficult times and you will have the joy of the Lord inside of you. What's your life about? Is your life about what I can get out of life or is your life about what I can give in this life to fulfill God's purpose? In conclusion, Jeremiah 29 verse 11 again. God says, and our children know this is their scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Just because God's got the plans doesn't mean we're living these plans. God is speaking to us and he's saying 2024 is coming and many of us will be away for a few days maybe a little bit of holiday maybe just resting maybe just uh, wherever you will be and you will reflect as we come to the end of this year we will reflect about 2023 we will look back and we'll say what happened in 2023 and if the major things in your life will be what you received and what you got and how you were made happy and what you, uh, what you achieved. You would have missed it. But if you can reflect and say, what did I do with my life in 2023? How did my life change someone else's life in 2023? How did my life make a difference in someone else's life in 2023? How was I less self-centered and more other people-centered centered in 2023? And if it's not very high, it's okay, because 2023 has passed. Or almost. But 2024 is coming. There's still a few weeks left that you can change 2023 in your life. But what difference is your life making wherever you are? And the question that I always, or that I like asking is, if Kainos closes next week and we don't open our doors again, and Kainos has passed. Will we be missed? Because we touched people's lives. With the love of Jesus Christ. Or will people just say. 
another one bites the dust. Well, people say, kainos. No, we, we, we have to try and help them. We have to try and do something to get kainos going in because kainos meant so much in our community. Ukrainian people should say, well, kainos cannot die now because kainos means so much in Ukraine. The Sutu people should be saying, Kainos, just please, please, Lord, just, just do something. They can't go now because Kainos has made such a big difference in, in, in Lesotho. Just remember, Kainos is not Michael, Madeleine, Renat and John. And Joshua Dimu. And Mamsi. And Joshua and Mariska and just a few of us, Jacobus and Lizelle. Kainos is you. If you die tomorrow, will there be a void in the kingdom of heaven? Because you're not here anymore. Will there be a part that someone else has to come in and fulfill? Or will it just be another one's gone? We greet him and let's just carry on. And that's your life. God comes and he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. He's given up his, us his plans. We need to sit down, open up our hearts, and say, Lord, give me vision so I cannot just see with my eyes, with my heart, what you want to do with my life. doesn't matter where you are. You might be retired. You might be too young. You might be too old. While you're breathing, God's still got a plan for your life and a purpose for your life to fulfill. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today, and before we go to the communion table, we come to you today to say, Lord, here am I. We sang a few songs today where we, we sang and said, Lord, let my life glorify you. We sang a few songs to saying, we say, yes, Lord, use me for your glory, for your glory, use me. And sometimes we sing these songs because it's got a, a great tune. But today we want to come and say, we don't want to sing tunes. We want to sing prayers. We want to sing out of our hearts. We want to say to you, we need you, Lord. But we also know that you want us. You don't need us, but you want us to be part of your great purpose on this earth. We're not afraid of the enemy. We're not afraid of death. We're not afraid of, of, of um, uh, uh, moving into a time where we might even be persecuted for your name and for the kingdom of God. We want to just be part of your purpose and fit into your plan for our lives. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We now going to move to a time of just sitting around the table and sharing communion together. There with your table, there with your family, there with your friends, group, it doesn't matter. But I want to ask you, as you take communion, to allow God to challenge you, to say, Lord, you didn't come to serve, you came, or you didn't come to be served, you came to serve. And you served us 
by giving your life for us. Lord, I want to give my life to you. Some of you think I'm talking about becoming a Christian. No, I'm not talking about becoming a Christian. Some of you might be thinking I'm talking about being born again. No, I'm not talking about being born again. I'm talking about giving your life to Christ so that He can be your King, so that He can be the one, so that you can fit into His purpose for your life. And as we share communion together, let's just focus on where we are. Challenge your children around the table. Challenge your wife. Challenge your husband. They might be angry with you on the way home for challenging them. Then you can say, I said so. But challenge each other and just say, us as a family, we as a family, those of you that are together as a family, we as a family, are we living out God's purpose? Are we so focused on achievement? Or are we focused on living out? And just there, as we take have part in the in the communion. Let's just come to God and say, Here am I, Lord. You paid the price so that I can live your dream through my life here on earth. Let's have communion together. The communion, uh, the bread and the and the and the glasses is on the table. We can just have together. Amen.